strains are not all the same and you have to consider that they may be different from each other. And this comes from, you know, the probiotic strains matter and, and I agree with that. This type of conclusion comes from quite an extensive amount of animal research that shows where scientists have compared different strains to each other in any number of different types of endpoints. But there are a few clinical trials that have also done this. Different strains and different preparations of probiotics may in fact be able to perform in a similar manner. Meta-analysis that was done a couple of years back and this person looked at the studies, the randomized controlled trials that were done for a variety of different gastrointestinal conditions, including antibiotic-associated diarrhea, Clostridium difficile-associated diarrhea, Helicobacter pylori-associated um, diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome, infectious diarrhea, necrotizing enterocolitis, pouchitis, and traveler's diarrhea. And what the authors concluded was across all diseases and probiotic species, positive significant effects of probiotics were observed for all age groups, single and multiple strains, and treatment lengths. In general, um, probiotics may be beneficial in the treatment and prevention of GI diseases. So in other words, do you always have to tie that back to a single strain? But also, surely not all strains function in a unique way. So that there may be, um, let me go forward one, there may be the concept that we have core mechanisms that exist across a range of probiotic bacteria, and those may lead to the concept of core benefits that, that these groups of microorganisms might be able to affect. Consistent benefits were seen in the necrotizing enterocolitis meta-analysis, which shows that probiotics in general are beneficial in this high-risk population. And so again, this type of analysis suggests that maybe the mechanism that leads to the probiotics being able to decrease the incidence and mortality associated with necrotizing enterocolitis is a mechanism that is shared by many members of you know, typical probiotic group. The only approved health claim for a probiotic in the European Union is for um, yogurt cultures and their ability to improve um, or decrease symptoms associated with lactose maldigestion. So they have acknowledged in this opinion that not all effects are strain specific. The reason that that's a reasonable question is because if in fact those probiotic strains are very different from each other, then the evidence that you get on one strain is not necessarily applicable or it doesn't necessarily inform the type of evidence you would expect to get from another strain. So you have to keep them separate. So I think if we get to the point where we understand the basic mechanisms behind how these strains are functioning and how they are bringing about the endpoints, the physiological benefits that they are causing, and we can, we can group these organisms into ones that are mechanistically similar, then I think it, the answer is yes. I think we can get to the point where it's scientifically legitimate to group these um, different strains into a single meta-analysis and to, and to have that meta-analysis inform us about use of that entire group of strains. But the idea that you could possibly consider the category for certain benefits has implications from a regulatory point of view because you're likely not misleading consumers to use the word probiotic on food if you are choosing strains that are coming from these well-studied species um, and administering them at an adequate dose that would be expected to have some type of a benefit. I think this is important for clinicians um, because I do think it's important that clinicians keep in mind that strain specificity of effects is, is really important when you're coming um, when you're looking at probiotics for medical conditions. So that strain-specific evidence is really going to be critical and you want to match the product with the evidence for the particular condition. However, for dietitians who are dealing more with a nutritional environment where you're trying to construct healthy diets for people, um, certainly the strongest recommendations still come from strain-specific evidence. But I think that it's reasonable, especially from what we're learning about the human microbiome and its importance in general to human health and how live microbes play an important role in that. Um, 
I think that encouraging fermented foods is probably also a reasonable dietary recommendation. And that's never going to be at the strain level. That is going to be at a broader level than that. And so I think that this scientific concept can be important there. And then finally, it's important to scientists because I think that we really do need future um, or further mechanistic research to find the commonalities among the different taxonomic groups so that we understand better what mechanisms are, are actually leading to the benefits that we're seeing. Thank you.